Thank you. you. may be seated. And I apologize again for forgetting that I'm supposed to turn that thing on upstairs. Thank you, Keith, for reminding me and for singing an extra verse of that hymn. (laughs) All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we are looking at Acts 13, 13 through 15. We touched on a little bit of what we're talking about tonight. Uh, The passage tonight, to the Jew first, is the name of the message. And we gave a little bit of background to that two weeks ago. Last week, of course, we were snowed out. But the last time we were together, uh, we looked at uh, the sorcerers and signs and uh, also touched a little bit on why Paul always went to the Jews. And so we begin, we'll start reading in Acts chapter 13, verse 6, which is the background from last week or two weeks ago. When they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. Not a very pleasant way to address someone. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about, seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we begin our study tonight and as we tie it in with what Paul did on each of his three missionary journeys and even what he sought to do on his journey to Rome, we pray, Father, that you will help us to understand the tactics of the early missionary church, the way in which they sought to make sure that the gospel was brought to places which were major crossroads so that it would reach the farthest extent of the empire. Father, help us to understand, too, the importance of reaching others around us, for we are at a crossroads here in this area, Philadelphia being a major metropolitan area, Camden and Collingswood and all the little towns around us, one solid block of people. And we pray, Father, that you'll help us to also be able to reach our community for Christ, and through that, many others in the immediate around vicinity. And then across the world, as we see the gospel being carried by modern means of transportation to the far reaches of the earth. We pray, Father, for your blessings upon our time tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you remember they had left Antioch in Syria, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that tonight and its location. They had sailed over to Cyprus, and they had landed on the east coast of Cyprus. From there, they had traveled inland, and if you can think of, from your perspective, here is the land of Israel over here, and above Israel is Syria, and then to the north of that, and sticking off to this direction for you, is is what we call Turkey today. They had sailed from Israel, they'd sailed over to Cyprus, they landed on this end, and then they traveled inland across the island to the dead center of the west coast of Cyprus. And we're going to pick up our text there tonight. But that place was known as Paphos, the city known today as Baffa, famous for the worship of the Roman goddess Venus, obviously a very immoral city, uh, the center of worshiping human sinful passions and lusts. It was a center of government, a center of commerce, and, uh, of course, much pagan activity there in that city. We find that after Paul had talked to the synagogue, the next place that he went was to a high government official. And um, sort of an interesting program for missions. If he could reach the high government official, that would mean there would be freedom of religion in that region. How we pray that God will reach our high government officials. Many times we sort of preach to the choir, I'm afraid. And we're glad to preach to those who already have a background and a knowledge of the Word of God. 
But oftentimes, we don't even pray for those in authority over us, except in the general pastoral prayer that we have on Sunday mornings. But how many of you pray every day for those in authority over us in this land? In the executive branch, in the judicial branch, and then those who are in our Senate and our House. And not only at the federal level, but at our state level too. Do you know them by name? Do you pray for them? Do you pray for the county commissioners? Do you pray for our town council, whatever town you live in? My wife and I pray for them every morning. These people who are in positions of authority over us in this land. But are we reaching them? God gave Paul a special knack. We're not told how he got in to have a, an interview with this Roman proconsul, Sergius Paulus. But he did. And God opened that man's heart. That was a man who was under the control of demonic influence through Elymas the sorcerer. A man who actually tried to block Paul from preaching. And God did a number on Elymas. We need to pray earnestly that God will bring people who are Bible-believing Christians into the sphere of influence for those men and women who are in positions of governmental power in our country. Pray earnestly for it every day. So he went from the synagogue, he went to reach the highest government official, and the next place we find him going and stopping is in a synagogue, as we'll see tonight. It's very important, and we find that God has used throughout history many to influence those in positions of governmental authority. The next thing that we learned was that John Mark, who was traveling with Paul and Barnabas, was used to only the kind of Jews that he had known back in Jerusalem. He hadn't been acquainted with Jews like Bar-Jesus, a man who was a sorcerer, a man who had sold himself over to Satan. And we noted that it was shortly after this, and we'll talking about that tonight, that John Mark decides he doesn't want to travel with Paul and Barnabas anymore, and he heads back to Jerusalem. We saw that there was a face-to-face -face showdown. And there are many times when it is necessary for a Bible-believing Christian to have a face-to-face -face showdown with those who are promoting evil those who are standing for darkness in the way of light. We see that Paul and Peter had that kind of a confrontation when Paul rebuked Peter for his wicked stand of separating himself from the Gentiles. We find that Moses withstood Janus and Jambres. We find Paul withstood Alexander the coppersmith. And Paul warns Timothy about that as well. Paul mentions a time when he gave his proclamation and nobody stood with him and he was about to go to the lions. Paul was used to this kind of confrontation. But we noted in closing last week that what impressed the deputy was not the miracle, and there is a distinction, those of you who are with us, when we studied miracles versus healings. Those are two separate spiritual gifts. A healing is where somebody who is sick is made well. A miracle includes things like this, where a man is made blind instead of receiving his sight. That is a miraculous event that occurred, which was not a healing. Miracles include things like Elijah crying out to the Lord and fire coming down from heaven. Moses stretching out his rod over the sea and the sea parting and so on like that. Those are not healings. Miracles and healings are two distinct things in categories and were two distinct spiritual gifts given in the early church. But what impressed the deputy was not the miracle, but the last verse it says, he was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. You see, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the miracles always pointed back to God. They weren't designed to give a great deal of pomp and pride to the man who performed the miracles. They were designed to point to something else. They were designed to point to the message 
that was being carried by the man who performed the miracle. Moses cast down his serpent, uh, his rod, and it became a serpent. He picked it up, and it became a rod again. Moses placed his hand into his bosom, and when he pulled it out, it was leprous, and he put his hand back into his bosom again, and it was normal again. The miracles that occurred in the ten plagues were not healings, but they were miracles designed to prove that the God of heaven is greater than all the gods of Egypt. And so the deputy listened to what Paul had to say about Jesus, and that's what astonished him. It was a salvation of grace, a salvation of faith, a salvation not of works, but of a gift from God. A salvation wrought not by a miracle like he had just seen, but by the cross of Calvary. People, we have an astounding message. We have a, a doctrine that is different than everything else that the world would teach about how to get to heaven. And the deputy had never heard anything like that. And that brings us now to verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers in the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Now remember, this is the context of the first missionary journey. Verses 1 through 5, they landed on the island of Cyprus. Uh, of Cyprus excuse me. <laughs> Didn't land on the island of Cyprus. They landed on the island of Cyprus. And um, they had left the mainland at Seleucia and touched down at Salamis. Salamis is the extreme eastern end of Cyprus. There were already multiple Jews settled there, which is why I think that's where Paul sailed first, because it mentions multiple synagogues. When they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues, plural, of the Jews. Paul had gone to the synagogue before he went to the pagan leadership on the island. In the synagogue, they get their new destination to Perga. In verse 12, in the previous 12 verses, we learn several important things that tie in with our study tonight. Why would Paul go to the synagogues first? because he could reach the largest number of people who would be open and receptive. Paul understood one of the principles that God has, which is God prepares hearts. And God had already prepared the hearts of those in the synagogues because every week they went through the same ritual, which was the reading of the scriptures. In fact, we'll see tonight, and we just read it a moment ago in our text, that there was a reading first before Paul got invited to speak. There was a reading out of the law, and then there was a reading out of the prophets, and there was a regular cycle through which a Jewish synagogue goes every year as they read through the law and the prophets. Now tell me, how does faith come to a person? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. These are people who, even if they didn't read the scripture at home, every week someone would stand up and read the assigned portion of scripture so that they would have heard it over and over and over and over and over again, growing from children in those synagogues up through adulthood, they would have heard the scripture read. God was preparing hearts. And so the first place Paul went was where God had prepared hearts. And there he would establish his beachhead. And from there he could reach out to others and have a place to send others who came to Christ to somebody who already knew a great deal about the scriptures. A lot of times it's important to do cold turkey evangelism. But then when that person trusts Christ, what do you do with them? What do you do with them? There has to be a place, unless you are willing to stay in one location for a, an extended period of time, working with new converts who have no other Christian contact, you must stay in that one place so that you can disciple 
these people whom you have led to Christ who have no background in the scripture. What Paul did, I think, is the divine plan, the way to go. When you lead people to Christ, you have someone that you can turn them over to if God is making you into an itinerant evangelist or what we would call a church planting missionary. You have to have some place where they can be taught. Paul did that. Paul was also one of the great rabbis, or trained by one of the great rabbis in history. I think he was one of the great rabbis also in history, though the Jews would not admit that. He had an automatic opening to preach when he went to synagogues. He would be dressed like a rabbi. He would have on distinctive clothes, distinctive prayer shawl. He would have distinctive markings on his clothing. And when he came in, people would know this is a rabbi. His audience would have that background necessary for knowing that a Messiah was coming. They were expecting a Messiah. They would already have a knowledge that keeping the law wasn't cutting it for them. That they all knew in their hearts that they had broken the law and it wasn't enough for salvation. Oh, the Pharisees didn't believe that. But the average Jew as he came with a sense of sin, hearing the scriptures read, would know that he really didn't have much hope. Sort of like Roman Catholicism today. Those folks, those poor dear people, go to their masses every week, the ones that are serious about it, and they're trying to build up merit to get to heaven. And they go through their rosary beads, and they have their novenas, and they have their special masses, and they have their prayers for the dead, and they light their candles, and they go through all the ritual because someone has lied to them and told them that this is the way you get to God. They pray to the saints because they've been told they can't pray directly to Jesus. They pray to Mary because, after all, Jesus is only the angry judge. And they cannot get through to him, but he'll always listen to his mother. And the Pope dies, and so all over the world, 800 million Roman Catholics begin to say prayers for the soul of the Pope to get the Pope out of purgatory. If that has to be done for the Pope, whom they consider to be the vicar of Christ, that is the representative of Christ on earth, and who, when he speaks ex cathedra, that is from his chair, he speaks infallibly on equal level with scripture. If they have to do that to get the Pope into heaven and out of purgatory, which does not even exist, what hope is there for them? They hear portions read from different ones of the Gospels in their churches, but then they are told it means something else. Paul was going to people who heard the scriptures read every week. People who had an expectancy of the coming of the Messiah. And so Paul talks about to the Jew first and also to the Greek in Romans 1.16. In Romans 2.9 he uses the same phrase, to the Jew first and also of the Gentile. In Romans 2.10, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So tonight what we see happening is Paul leaves Cyprus by boat. And now if you can picture it once again from your perspective, here's the land of Israel over on this side. And here's Cyprus out here in the middle. And Paul has landed on this end. He's gotten all the way to the far end, right in the dead center of the far end. And he gets on a boat. And then he heads, from your perspective, let's see, that would be um, this uh, yeah, this way, <laughs> northwest. <laughs> he heads, it's actually north-northwest, it's more north than it is west, to tra reach the coast of what is modern-day Turkey today. So if you can think of the Mediterranean Sea, sort of this great big huge oval like this, and here's Cyprus, and here up above is Turkey, and we're in Asia Minor at this point, and as you go a little farther over, you reach what is today Istanbul, 
which was Constantinople, which was Byzantium before that. And there is a small gap of water there called the Bosphorus. And when you cross that, you are going from uh, Asia Minor into what is the western, uh, eastern end of Europe. I'm putting my hands backwards. It's hard to think the east and west here, uh, but so that you can see where we're going. So Paul is going up like this, and he is hitting the coast of Turkey. That's the passage we read tonight. North, northwest across the northern, Med northern Mediterranean Sea to the coast of Turkey. It's an area that used to be known as Pamphylia. It's at the seaport in Paphos that John Mark decides to take a different boat as an argument as to whether or not he takes it back to Jerusalem from that point or after they land he gets on another boat and heads back. But it appears the way it's phrased, at least in the Greek text here, that where he actually leaves them is after they hit the coast of Turkey, uh, or before they hit the coast of Turkey, which means he would have left from the island of Cyprus to head on back. Nothing is said about the time that Paul and Barnabas spent at Perga. It's rather interesting. They land there, but the text doesn't give any indication that they spend any time at Perga, except it tells us that they're headed north, due inland, over some very rough terrain to reach their next destination, which is Antioch of Pisidia. Now, we need to make some distinctions between the Antiochs that are mentioned in the text and the, uh, the fact that they are different. The Antioch in Syria is the Antioch from which Paul and Barnabas and John Mark started out on their missionary journey. That Antioch in Syria, the beginning point, is only 16 miles from the Mediterranean Sea and it's in what we would call modern day Syria. It is 300 miles north of Jerusalem by land. If you drew a line from Jerusalem to Antioch in uh, Syria, you would go 300 miles. You know, sometimes I think it's lost on us the distances that these people traveled by foot. That is a long way to walk. If you were in a car, and in this area, if, it's good if you can average 50 miles an hour, it would take you six hours on a modern highway in a car to drive that distance. And many people walked those distances. It took a long time. So as we read our text, remember this is a lot of condensation going on here. Uh, the book of Acts doesn't describe for us every little place that they stopped along the way in the sea journeys. It describes the, the destination points and the beginning points of the sea journeys. But whenever there's a walking journey, and the one we have tonight is a walking journey, it's going from the coast due inland. So uh, at the time of the Roman Empire, Antioch in Syria, that beginning point, was considered the third city of the Roman Empire. In AD 526, 250,000 people were killed there in an earthquake. At its height, it had a population of 500,000 people. It was a powerful, wealthy city. Its main street through the city was four miles in length, and every side of that main street was lined with what we would call multi-million dollar mansions. That's where the rich people lived, on this beautiful wide paved street that ran straight through the city and then the less expensive houses and shops and things like that were on the outer edges, sort of as a buffer zone in case any enemy attacked, they wouldn't hit the rich people first. All the rich people lived right down the center of town. Antioch in Pisidia, on the other hand, versus Antioch in Syria, was 100 miles inland toward the center of Turkey and more than 500 miles from Jerusalem. You can still see the ruins today. A great deal of archaeological excavation has been done at the site. It's near the Turkish town of Yalavach. That's the destination point that Paul and Barnabas are going to, and it's also, we discover, and we see this in all of Paul's journeys, a strategic location for the spread of the gospel. Antioch and Pisidia was a great commercial center that controlled another main trade route between Ephesus and what was called the Sicilian Gates, that is, the main opening in the mountains into the region of Cilicia. 
It would thus be the center of travel, trade, news, and the means to spread the gospel to other areas to the west and to the east in the ancient world. Verse 14, when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Now, it's interesting because it, all it says is that uh, they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. It doesn't say that they went in and announced who they were and tried to get everybody's attention and waved their arms around a little bit. It's like having a visitor come in the back door of this church and come in and sit down. Now, would we notice it if we had a visitor? You think we would? <laughs> I think we would. Whenever we have a visitor, we notice it. Well, in this case, in particular, is because we have a very large auditorium and a very small handful of people who are here on a regular basis. When visitors come in, we notice them. We notice two people who came in this morning and sat down. Both of them have been here before, so we knew who they were, but it had been a long time. When we have visitors, we notice them. The folks here did something very interesting in addition to noticing them. They clearly greeted them. In fact, they invited them to speak. Now, we don't do that on a regular basis, but if we noticed somebody whom we had a, an idea of who they were, they might get invited to say a word. We had some visitors at our 75th anniversary. And you know, we invited a bunch of them to speak, to bring their greetings to this congregation on the 75th anniversary of the Bible Presbyterian denomination. They came up here and spoke. And some brought greetings and some told us about their own ministries. But they spoke. Here we have Paul and Barnabas. All they did was come in and sit down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, they were invited to speak. So when they came in, what do you think the people thought as they saw them? Well, we know that first of all, they would have clearly been identified as Jews because Gentiles didn't attend synagogue. So right off the bat, you know that they're Jews. The second thing you would have known about them is they were religious Jews. They showed up on the Sabbath day in the synagogue. Now, you know, we have a problem getting men out to church. The synagogue couldn't be a synagogue unless it had a minyan of men. At least 12 men had to be gathered together to form a synagogue. We wouldn't make a synagogue here, folks, tonight. Wouldn't work. Don't have 12 men here. These are men coming to worship. They saw their responsibility as Jews who believed the word of God to be where the word of God was going to be read and proclaimed. Not to be home watching TV or something else. How important is it? Well, that Sabbath day, they heard somebody speak. They had somebody speak who revolutionized their town. In fact, we discover that later in chapter 14, as Paul returns to that place, some great things happened there. And the people who weren't there were the ones who missed it. We save that for later. Paul would clearly have been identified by the type of clothing that he wore. I talked about that a moment ago. The type of clothing that a rabbi wore would stand out. He would be known as a rabbi. He probably was greeted when he came in. That's typical in a synagogue. I wish it were typical here. Where when visitors come in, the friendly faces of our congregation would immediately go up to the visitor and welcome them warmly and tell them how much we appreciate them coming. And being not merely a visitor, but being our guest. And then after the service, you always hear me say, and please greet your neighbors. And I've told you about occasions where I have said that and then seen visitors out here who actually stood and waited for a moment and nobody greeted them.
the attributes of hospitality spill over into the meeting of the church where we welcome those who visit, those who are, in fact, our guests, who have come here to see if there is a body with which they would feel comfortable and with which they could identify. That happened, obviously, there. Somebody probably discreetly asked about them and found out who Paul was, that he was a student of Gamaliel. It's not in the text. I'm merely surmising that because of the warm reception that they are given here. But after the reading of the Law and the Prophets, the text tells us that they were invited to come and say something. And that was certainly practiced, though not so much in modern synagogues, but in ancient synagogues that were far distant from Jerusalem. If visiting Jews came, visiting male Jews came, who seemed to have some kind of authority or rabbinic training, or who had news of what was going on back in Jerusalem, they would be invited to give a word to the brethren. When we've had missionaries come, we have often invited them to stand up and give a few words about what's going on in the field. The same thing was true here. They were invited to stand and perhaps give news from Jerusalem in that little rather vague invitation to speak. It's uh, give us an exhortation. And uh, so the visiting rabbi certainly would have been invited to give a short homily or a word of encouragement to the congregation. Think of yourself as being 500 miles in days when people walked and sailed by sailboat from the center where the Jewish faith was located. Would you want to hear news from home? Would you want to hear what was happening in the temple? Would you want to hear any exciting things that perhaps God had been doing in his land? I think if you were far, far away and someone came from your hometown to where you were, you would want to hear something. You would want a word of encouragement. You might want to ask, how is so-and-so who is a friend or a relative of mine who lives there? Because you don't have internet, you don't have radio, you don't have telephone, you don't have television. You have very, very slow communications via parchment mail. And sometimes it got there and sometimes it didn't. And so Paul and Barnabas are invited to give a word of exhortation. You know, it's interesting that Paul had a very good reception here in this place because we find him returning here in chapter 14, in verse 21. Let me read verses 20 through 22 and see what Paul was doing. Howbeit, as the disciples, this is after he's been stoned, after the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when we get to this text, it's interesting, he went into the city where they had stoned him. <laughs> Before he went back, he didn't say, man, let's get out of here while the getting's good before they find out that God raised me back up. Verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. They're backtracking their way through the missionary journey, which is their first missionary journey, which they preached the gospel in each of those cities, all important cities, as we'll see when we get to them. What were they doing? Verse 22 tells us. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. News had probably reached them already that Paul had been stoned. They might have gotten a little bit weak in the knees. Paul comes back and he confirms the souls of the disciples. And Antioch is the last place mentioned on that list. The first place he had such a great reception in Turkey, a land that, of course, is completely controlled by Islam today. Secular government, but nonetheless all Muslim. Difficult, hard field to reach. A place where not long ago some Christians in a Bible office were 
surrounded by Muslims who bound them, gagged them, and slit their throats. They've had the gospel there, folks. And Satan hates it when there is the gospel in any area. He's trying to remove it from the United States. Someday the United States may be like Turkey, where it is dangerous to be a Christian. But anyway, confirming the souls of the disciples. So he wanted to make sure that they were stable in their faith. Number two, he wanted them to continue in their faith. He said, exhorting them to continue in the faith. And number three, warning them of trouble ahead. He told them that we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. Be stable, continue, recognize what's coming. Same kind of message for us today. Be stable, continue, know what's coming. Now that first missionary journey, the one we're talking about right now, had the shortest route. It only got up into Turkey. The second missionary journey, which we'll be seeing in a couple of chapters, the second missionary journey has a much longer route because it gets all the way over into Greece, into all the provinces of Achaia, Macedonia, and Thrace. The third missionary journey had the longest route of all of them, so Paul is branching out a little bit at a time as we go through these missionary journeys, and on each one of them he goes back and does the same thing, confirming all the churches where he's been, but then he reaches new territory. So we see the expansion of the gospel, not just going to the far ends of the earth and preaching the gospel and then sort of working your way back, we see him doing it in stages. Much of the proclamation of the gospel is that way doing it in stages. You think of the modern missionary movement, going back to people like William Carey and later David Livingston and others who went Hudson Taylor to China, doing it in stages, beginning on the coasts, in the big cities, and then working their way inland like Livingston did. Paul set the example. And so that third missionary journey is the longest, and a good deal of that one is by land rather than by boat, where Paul is backtracking much of what he had done on his second journey. But in every case, we see him going to the Jewish population first for the ten reasons that we already discussed two weeks ago. The later journeys were not only for evangelism, but for making sure that the churches were succeeding, for encouraging believers in the churches that were already planted. I know this is something that Gary and Pat Johnson do when they go back to Kenya. They go back to encourage the believers and to make sure they are established in their faith. They not only go for evangelism, but to encourage the believers. I know the Carlson brothers do the same thing as they go back. For training, for encouragement, for church growth, for stability. As they go back to serve in places where they have been before. Ken Olson, the same thing as he went to Cameroon just, before, or just after he was uh, here uh, for the 75th anniversary. You know, it's a biblical principle, and we see Paul giving it to us here as we look at the text. Paul continued to have a ministry among the churches where he served. That's rather interesting. Even after he left and the churches are turned over to elders that he appointed. We'll see that Paul is the one who appointed elders uh, as he makes his back trips on a lot of these missionary journeys. He's appointing the elders there. And you know, it's rather interesting. It wasn't like today in most modern churches where a pastor goes from one church and then is called to another and then the first church gets a, another pastor and that pastor is jealous about the pastor who was before and doesn't want to have anything to do and tries to eliminate the memory of that pastor from the church. There are churches like that, believe me. You know, a lot of churches in denominations, especially where, where the denomination moves the pastor from church to church, the new pastor is very, very jealous of his new congregation and doesn't want the old pastor to show his head at all. It's a very sad way. That problem was also in the early church. Uh, we see that with diatrophies in 3 John 
verses one, uh, 5 through 9. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom, if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. So he's encouraging the church to have these people in the church who have had ministry among the brethren and are traveling now as missionaries, perhaps even being supported by or formerly supported by some of those churches. But listen to this. Because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. Interesting. Where did Paul go first? He went to the Jewish synagogues first. So we have Jewish pockets that are supporting these missionaries that are going out. And they're going out not taking money from the Gentiles, though they are reaching Gentiles. Verse 8, We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Important fellow helpers. Now verse 9, key verse. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Now, John, the apostle, the beloved disciple of Jesus, he writes to this church, Diotrephes gets wind of the fact that this message is coming, gets hold of it, and won't let the church read it. Won't let anybody say what John has said. Doesn't want to have John's influence in the church anymore. One of the disciples of Christ. Here's what John says, verse 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, but forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. You see, there was an understanding in the early church, which I wish were most more so the case with modern true believers. I'm not talking apostates, I'm not talking heretics, I'm not talking the compromisers, but within the true church of God, that we are one body. That is not just us for no more, because soon it may be just us for no more. That the body of Christ is connected to the same head, every member of the body throughout the world. And when one member suffers, the whole body suffers. And when one member rejoices, the entire body rejoices. That we might learn that the chief command of Christ. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Diotrephes obviously didn't. And John, in so many words, says that means that he does not know God. A man who was in charge of a church that John planted. A man that was in charge of a church where John had encouraged them to send out missionaries. And now, when those people were coming back, if anybody in the church received them, Diotrephes was cutting them off. He was excommunicating them from the church. That's not what we see with the Apostle Paul as Paul goes through to the various destinations where he goes. He is always welcome back where he has been. I hope we could do the same thing. I think there are not many pastors of this church that are still yet alive, but if some came back, those who have served in various types of ministry here, I hope we would be able to welcome them and encourage them. When they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. The gift of exhortation in Scripture is a very important gift. It's one of the speaking gifts, and thus it is one of the gifts that is only given to the men, and it is here men being asked to exhort. And so Paul preaches to them 
Jesus. He exhorts them to trust the Messiah. We'll be getting into that in future weeks. An exhortation not merely to the elders, not merely to a few people, but an exhortation for the people. That which is proclaimed about Christ should be heard by all. We do wish there were more here. We're thankful for those who are watching on the internet. Those who are shut-ins, those who are not able to make it here. We're thankful for all the mechanisms that we have in our modern culture. But we must never forget that the important thing is to reach people. If you have an exhortation for the people, the important things are not the technology, though we're thankful for it. The important things are that we reach people. And so the question is, are we reaching people with the message of Christ? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us to reach the people, that you will give clear guidance and direction. We do try very hard to reach those people who have a background, who know something of the Scripture. But we also recognize that your word declares that in the latter days that the love of many shall wax cold. There are the subtle temptations of the world around us to pull us away from Christ. The pleasures of the flesh, the riches of the world, the sidetracks that Satan sets up so beautifully to trap us and to snare us and to pull us away from our chief focus, which should be Jesus. Father, we pray that you will help us to go when you call us, to reach out in key locations so that others might hear the truth, that you would prepare the way in advance and that as you do so, we would have the joy of seeing others come to the Savior. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.